But um, uh, I th think everybody knows me. I'm Ethan Minton. I'm on the development team. My uh, colleagues uh, from development, Aaron Urima and Dan Del Rossi are both here as well. I just want to thank you for taking the time to, to join uh, us um, and connect with, with Kristen around this exciting new venture. Um, I did want to um, let you know, you probably saw when you logged, uh, when you, when you joined that the session is being recorded and we just, we do that so that for folks who can't be here, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to send that out afterwards. Um, there will be, after Kristen's um, uh, remarks, there will be plenty of time for questions and conversation. You can hang on to them or pop them in the chat box and then we can um, uh, bring those, uh, bring those up um, at, uh, at the end. And um, so uh, thank you again for being here. And I'm going to hand it over to uh, Good Shepherd Food Bank President Kristen Maley. Thanks, Ethan. And thank you all for being here. Um, we are going to keep this one much more conversational than some of our other um, uh, events, um, virtual events, uh, just because we find a lot of people just have a lot of questions about this one, as, which makes sense. So I'm going to share just a little bit of the background of how Harvesting Good came about. Um, and then we'd love to open it up and, and just hear the questions that, that you have or want to hear more about the venture. So, um, so Harvesting Good, um, as you've read, is a, a newly launched, wholly owned for-profit subsidiary of Good Shepherd Food Bank. Um, it is organized as a public benefit corporation corporation, meaning that it is um, purposely defined as a mission-driven organization rather than a for-profit organization whose profits are meant to benefit shareholders. Um, and the mission is defined as improving access to nutritious food and strengthening regional food systems in the Northeast. Um, we did organize it purposely as a for-profit organization because we do intend this venture to um, generate profits, and we will be using um, we will be using public infrastructure, uh, you know, water and sewer and roads and bridges. And so we believe as a as a profit generating company, then we should be paying back taxes to the communities where we are using that infrastructure. So that was a purposeful decision. Um, and um, and really, this program is or this program, this this company is is an outgrowth of our Mainers Feeding Mainers program, which I think you're all aware of, which is our local food purchasing program. Um, and through our Mainers Feeding Mainers program, we realized. Um, how powerful the purchasing power is of the food bank. Um, we do purchase quite a bit of food and with Maine's, most of Maine's food producers, they're small and mid-sized companies, which means our, our cust um, the value of us being a customer is, is meaningful to these businesses. And so we really found that um, by, by buying local, we have we can add an economic development component to our work, um, especially in our rural communities, which have some of the highest rates of hunger. And we certainly learn from our partners that we are helping them grow their businesses. We are helping helping them hire workers um, and invest in their businesses and, and ultimately invest in their communities. Um, and so Mainers Feeding Mainers has just has been a phenomenal um, success for the organization and for the all the um, Farmers that are that are part of the program, we now work with over 85 farms investing over a million dollars a year in these food businesses. Um, and so we wanted to continue to grow the program, but what we found was that during Maine's relatively short growing season, we really are almost maxed out at how much food our network can even handle. We have an abundance of fresh local produce this time of year, which is a wonderful thing. Um, they joke up in the county, right? This is the time of year where you lock your car doors, otherwise there's gonna be zucchini in your back seat. Um, and, and, and the same as even our food pantries, there's, you know, between community gardens and Mainers feeding Mainers, there's just an abundance of fresh food, which is wonderful. The problem is once we hit January, that's all gone. Um, fortunately, we're because of our cold storage technology, we can have potatoes and carrots and apples almost year round, which is great. Um, but, you know, the root crops other than potatoes start to peter out around January, February, and then we really don't have any local produce for quite some time. Um, and so what we started to do was we said, well, let's let's expand Mainers Feeding Mainers to include food processors and find a food processor in Maine that can help um, uh, process these vegetables so that we can have them year round. Um, and what we found out pretty quickly is there are no food processors, not only in Maine, but anywhere in the Northeast. Um, there were a couple attempts to start some ventures that we followed and were, and were involved with, including Coastal Farms in Belfast and Northern Girl in Van Buren. Um, both of those ventures failed for a variety of reasons. Um, and um, 
And then there are some smaller other ventures happening in there's one in Vermont, one in Western Massachusetts, but they are nonprofit, very small um, processors that are that are really reliant on on grants to be sustainable because they're operating at a, at a pretty small scale. Um, we uh, did a, a lot of research, somewhat uh, partly funded through Feeding America, doing research with the University of Maine on what processing capabilities could exist. Um, narrowed it down to freezing is really the best option. Canning, um, anything in a jar is so expensive because of the cost of packaging compared to freezing. Um, and um, um, and so we actually at one point looked into, goodness, should the food bank just invest in a processing facility? Um, and what we found is it is incredibly expensive, um, which is why we, there really aren't many. Um, and, and essentially, in order to cover the fixed costs of the infrastructure, you need to be operating at a massive scale to even begin to cover your um, the variable costs and, and even and overcome the fix the, the cost to pay for the fixed assets. Um, and so we actually reached out to a few major processors that there's, um, there's one in upstate New York and they are part of the global food system and they just have their business model does not, has no room for local food at all. They are buying food from all over the world to get it out as cheap as possible. Um, and so we were really, um, we were really struck by, um, by kind of how, how our food system works when it comes to processed food. Um, we are obviously, Hannaford is a great partner of ours. So they were part of these conversations as well. And they've shared with us that they would love to have local food year round. And there is just no, absolutely no source of local food other than fresh food during the short growing season. Um, we also partnered with Sodexo, um, who is a, uh, they're a, they handle a lot of, um, uh, their food operators for a lot of institutions such as um, for example, the University of Maine, they, they operate the, the food systems there, uh, operations there. And they, similarly, they are committed to 20% of all their food. They want to be local. And they said, outside of the growing season, we don't even come close to meeting that goal with the exception of milk. They said there is just no option for local food. So we really saw a great opportunity, but couldn't figure out how to crack that nut because of the upfront fixed cost. Um, then we ended up connecting with... Um, Maine's blueberry processors. Um, it was just a, a fortuitous, we were in the same room at the same time at a food system conversation. And we were hearing about how Maine's blueberry processors are facing global competition. It's depressing blueberry prices. Um, these businesses are were really looking to diversify revenue. Um, but they were talking about the amazing freezing and packaging capacity that they have. Um, so we went up and visited at the time we visited Wyman's. Um, this is Matt Chin and I. Matt is, was my partner at Good Shepherd doing this research. And it is a world-class fruit freezing and packaging operation. I've, I've never seen anything like it. Um, and we'd asked about the freezing part of it. And they said, yeah, basically operates for six weeks out of the year. And then it gets shuttered down until next blueberry season. And we said, holy cow. Like, <laughs> um, and so we started doing some research about, well, what would it take for you to be able to process vegetables? And, um, and you know, the difference um, that I have learned, you may already know this, but what I learned is vegetables have to be cooked before they can be frozen. Otherwise they will continue to degrade while in even in a frozen state. Um, and so they have to be cooked for a very short period of time. And obviously vegetables need to have some kind of prep work. They need to be peeled or cut, for example, other than like a blueberry, which can just be picked and get right onto the conveyor belt. Um, and so uh, we, we originally were working just with Wyman's where it now expanded to another processor, W.R. Allen. Um, and they were both really interested in the opportunity. However, we're very clear they don't want to do a brand expansion. They don't want to start a new line. They just want to monetize their fixed asset for a longer period of time. That's what they were looking for. Um, so Good Shepherd decided to, then why don't we create the brand um, and essentially do be the sales and marketing arm um, and then utilize Wyman's and W.R. Allen essentially as a co-packer um, and that we would invest in the necessary equipment for them to expand their operations to accommodate vegetable processing as well as fruit processing. Um, so that was kind of the model that we we came up with, the hypothesis of how this could work. Um, they've been fabulous to work with. Um, and we ended up switching to W.R. Allen midstream because COVID hit. 
<laughs> um, Wyman's business exploded as the world all started making smoothies at home. <laughs> um, so we are thrilled for Wyman's and they basically said, we are so overwhelmed. We, we just, we can't, we've got to focus on our core business, which makes absolute sense for them. Um, and so they said, however, we have this partner down the road, W.R. Allen, who I think is a fourth or fifth generation blueberry processor, much, much smaller. Um, and so, um, and they don't have a retail line the way Wyman's does. So their business was actually really struggling. So they were very interested partners um, at finding a, a new revenue stream for their company. So they've been a fabulous partner. So that's where we're making the investment um, in um, adding what we're calling a, a floret machine and a, and a blancher. And I say floret because we're starting with broccoli and I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, but then Wyman's is still going to be doing the packaging and the distribution. Um, one of the things that we've learned through um, um, talking with some of the processors that that didn't that were not successful was the problem of distribution of getting being a, a newcomer to the to a retail brand is um, incredibly challenging um, and distribution is everything and so being able to lean into Wyman's existing distribution network um, is is huge. Um, also, um, again, with the connection with Hannaford and Cisco, we were able to get Hannaford to agree to carry the brand in all of their stores and Sodexo to carry the brand um, through all their institutional customers. Um, I'll also explain, for example, why are we even bothering to sell this product? Wouldn't we just want to just process this for the food bank? Um, and the reason is scale. And we talked about that. The only way this, this um, venture could even be remotely sustainable um, is to we need to be at a minimum of two million pounds a year in volume in order to really be able to um, use the kind of equipment that makes of a, a product that's even remotely affordable. Um, and to be at two million pounds a year is way more than the food bank could be able to move. It's a lot of broccoli. Um, and we even realize this product needs to be at, needs to be sold through beyond Maine. Maine simply does not have enough consumers itself to to um, to to justify the kind of investment in this this facility, um, and so that's why Hannaford was and, and Sodexo are great partners because they have a northeast footprint, um, and so they'll be able to sell this product throughout the north, northeast market. They also both confirmed that because the food system is so global. Um, that consumers, um, cons they have found and tested and affirmed that consumers in the Northeast, if the product is, is, is from the Northeast, they consider it local because the other broccoli that we're gonna be competing with is from China or South America. Um, so Maine's pretty close comparatively speaking. <laughs> um, so, and Maine has a great reputation obviously as a, as a quality food producing state. Um, we did decide to start with broccoli because um, fun fact, broccoli is the number one selling frozen vegetable across retail and institutional markets in the Northeast. Um, also Maine already grows an abundance of broccoli. Maine, it, Maine's climate is very hospitable to broccoli. And there's a lot of experience of growing broccoli here in Maine. Um, and the other trifecta that made it the perfect choice is, is broccoli is immediately after blueberry season. Um, so for Wyman's and W.R. Allen, it allows them to keep the seasonal workforce on for, an, for another additional harvest season beyond blueberries. Um, and that was a real of real interest to both those companies. They really wanted to, they, they take great pride in being, um, in being great employers in their communities and they wish they could keep workers all year and they just don't have the work for them. Um, so the fact that they can extend the, the working season for their workforce is, is a, huge, um, a huge plus for them that they're really excited about. Um, um, trying to, the other uh, benefit, I'll say kind of the long-term benefits that we see for this is, um, again, what we've learned from our research is with the exception of blueberries and potatoes, all of Maine farms grow only for the fresh market because there is no processing facility for them to sell into. So that really limits our farmers' um, sales channel and, and not only the length of their selling season, but um, how far their products can travel, which limits how many consumers they can reach. Um, so having a food processing channel for them to sell into greatly expands their opportunities to grow their businesses. Um, so we see this one as, as a great economic development um, investment in some of Maine's most um, uh, most 
uh, poor community. So where this is we're going to be operating in the uh, broccoli will be grown in in Aroostook County and and um, uh, Wyman's is Washington County and W R Allen is in Hancock County. Um, and we're going to be growing jobs in each of those three locations, which we're thrilled with. Um, how it's going to benefit for the food bank? It's like oh yeah, let's get back to the food bank. How how is this helping? Um, and um, so a couple of things. So one is we we do project that in three years, again, when we hit two million pounds as our goal, we will be break even. And after that, um, we will be generating free cash flow. Um, so after we pay off, obviously the invest the uh, the capital investments and whatever we need to invest in the company to continue its growth, all free cash flow will go back to benefiting food banks um, throughout the Northeast. Um, it's not just going to be Good Shepherd because we know this product is going to be sold throughout the Northeast. And so we want to be able to communicate the value of this brand to all consumers who will be purchasing this product. Um, so we're going to be, we've already connected with all of our food bank um, sisters across the Northeast and have told them about this opportunity. They're super excited. Several of them have reached out saying, can we buy the broccoli from you? We'd love to have local broccoli. Um, so they likely will be customers as will Good Shepherd. Um, we'll probably work out something with food banks where we do kind of just a cost pricing, um, something like that. Um, and then the other piece that we're anticipating is um, I've never been to any kind of food processing facility that doesn't either at the beginning of the run or an ending of the run have, have I don't know what you want to call it, they have they have trial runs where, oh, we didn't get the florette cut exactly right. They have, you know, where we, and they always have excess product. Um, typically that gets thrown away. We are gonna be, we are hoping that we will be able to um, re, re that, use that product that is perfectly quality product and be able to um, have that available as well to the, to the network. Um, we don't know exactly what that will look like because we haven't done our first run yet, but we're, again, from the places we've have visited we anticipate that that will be an opportunity. The other opportunity is that the food bank gets an abundance of broccoli donated to it every year, usually a several truck trailer, tractor trailer loads. Um, and it's oftentimes it all comes at once and it's this massive push to get broccoli out. It would be wonderful if we could give a lot of it for the give out fresh and then maybe take some of that truck load and bring it up and tack it onto a run that, that, that they're doing for harvesting good. Um, and just pay, you know, a, a marginal cost, for example, to have that process for us. So that's another benefit that we that we see um, potentially. Um, so this definitely has grown beyond our initial um, thoughts of where this was headed. Um, but in some ways, I just think it's it's grown in a, in just a beautiful way. Um, I think it really leverages. Um, some amazing assets that Maine has had already, and in terms of the expertise of the blueberry processing industry, not only in terms of processing, but also in food safety and distribution and warehousing, as opposed to having to recreate it all from scratch, it leverages Maine's rich, rich heritage of growing broccoli. Um, I never knew how much broccoli we grew, but we actually one of the largest producers of broccoli in the East Coast. Um, and so let's make that available all year round. Um, so we're really excited about this opportunity. Um, I'm sure there are things I haven't covered, but that's kind of how it all came about. And now I'd love to hear what questions um, you all have. Thank, thanks, Kristen. And for anybody that has questions, just feel free to unmute yourself. If you're more comfortable popping in the chat box, that, of course, is, is fine, too. So um, what are we anticipating after three years that you think you might annually make to, to donate back? Um, um, I don't have the projections in front of me, so I don't know, <laughs> but I will. Um, yeah, so we, like I said, we hope to break even after three years and then we do start churning off positive cash flow. It does, it actually pretty quickly gets into six figures um, because this is a pretty large operation. Um, and we also anticipate that um, essentially this year is going to be what we call our proof of concept year. So this year we're going to be growing about uh, processing half a million pounds of broccoli um, and prove the concept that we can actually successfully process a quality product. Um, after that, the goal is to then scale broccoli first to 1 million pounds a year in the second year, and then to 2 million pounds in the third year. Um, and then once we've shown that we can do this and scale it, the next thing will be to add a second product line. Um, and so after um, broccoli, we'll be working with our customers to figure out what other product is high in high demand 
that also grows well in Maine and or the Northeast. We are not gonna limit this just to Maine product if it doesn't make sense to. Um, and also um, that will not be disruptive obviously to blueberry or broccoli um, processing. Um, and so we do anticipate that this will eventually be anywhere from a 10 to a $20 million um, um, operation. Um, not gonna throw, it's, we're not, we're, and we're, we're looking at single digit margins. Um, um, even when we're, even when we're fully at scale, um, no, we have learned, um, nobody goes into a mid-scale vegetable processing facility to make a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> this is why nobody's done it. Um, because there, it's just, it's such a, it's such a tight margin. Um, so, but we believe, um, so even in the six figures, that is still a meaningful number to go to certainly to help ending hunger. But again, I, I really think the true benefit of this venture for ending hunger is going to be the building of economic development in some of our poorest communities in Maine, um, creating a lot more year round value jobs. Um, the economic multiplier of agriculture is strong because the inputs are all are all purchased locally. Um, so there's definitely a ripple effect um, of that. Um, and then just the strengthening of regional food systems. Um, the pandemic has definitely made all of us aware of how much we are part of a global food system and how and how quickly that food system can be very vulnerable. Um, we all saw empty shelves for the first time ever. Um, and so the fact that we could have um, um, you know, a whole series of vegetables that are that that are secured, grown, and processed locally, um, we think is um, uh, just a huge opportunity. So I'm hoping it would be millions of dollars in free cash flow. Who knows? We'll see what the growth is, but we at least know there'll be, um, again, at the top line, anywhere from 10 to 20 million, depending on how many products we're able, how quickly we're able to scale. And you mentioned jobs, which is, you know, mm -hmm. traditionally very exciting, but right now in the job market that currently exists in Maine, I mean, that is a big concern for me as an employer. And if you're going to, how are the farmers going to handle this? And, you know, what, what's the plan for that? Yeah. So they tell us that they're, that they're not concerned at this time, because again, right now they have a steady workforce and granted a lot of the workers that work at both the farm and the processors are, um, um, I forget the visa. There's a certain visa that oh, they are. What we would call, yeah. you know, the colloquial term, right? Is it's basically, it's, it's migrant worker is essentially. Um, and however they're, and they're seasonal. And so, and they come back year after year after year. Um, and they have all had said, if you have longer that we can work, we will stay longer. And so they see that it's gonna be their existing workforce that they've always had, just keeping on for longer periods of time. The exception to that right now is at Circle B Farms where they do intend needing to, needing to actually add also new labor as well. But again, they, um, they're not seeing that as an, as an issue at this point. Um, and what, what is the broccoli season? And um, in, in regards to like, so when these workers come in um, into the community, what's their time length going to extend to by months? And, I, and what's the, how many weeks slash months do you anticipate it will take to process all, you know, maybe not the initial year, I know that's a learning year, but yeah. Yeah, so broccoli season starts um, in, it can start as early as September and can go through as late as November. Um, so we're actually looking for a late September crop is the kind of, um, is how they planted it, knowing that we need to get through all of blueberry season and blueberry season can, can sometimes bleed into September. So we wanted to make sure we gave ample time. So they planted the crop for a mid to late September harvest and then with several other weeks of harvest going into October. So our plan is it will be processing from September into October um, and, um, and then it will be packaged after that. So for the initial year, for the 500,000 pounds, it's probably only gonna add maybe an extra two to three weeks um, initially. Um, but again, as we, as we ramp up the volume, that, that, that uh, will grow. Um, we do have some estimates of how many jobs we plan. I don't have it at my fingertips, but we can get that information. Um, and it actually reminds me, Ethan, if you can make a note, we'll make sure we have that right handy for the uh, next time we do this. Because again, we've, 
We've had to fill out a lot of grant applications. So we had all three of our partners, please estimate what you think the jobs that you're going to be adding. And so they've done all of that already. I just don't have it at my fingers. I'm sure they'll also be interested in for future knowledge about where you're going to house them. Yes. Yeah. And again, we're not talking, you know, we're not, we're not talking hundreds of folks. It's, um, but it's. No, uh, I know. Yeah. No, these are great questions. Um, I'm also going to add just because because I'm I'm if you're like me and you hear the word migrant labor, you're probably going. I thought you talked about quality jobs. Are these really quality jobs? How are we going to be monitoring this? Um, and so you know, right now, um, obviously, we're working incredibly closely with these companies and know them very well and um, and feel very confident in their commitment to and alignment with our values. Um, however, as we grow and as we bring on more workers and even as and more workers need to get hired, how are we going to keep track to make sure we really are making sure that all the steps in the supply chain are aligned with our values? Um, so we are right now working with a, um, a consultant who, um, uh, her name's, uh, she's from a firm called New Eco Consulting. She's um, the former vice president of sustainability for Ahol Delhaize. Um, and she is putting together a proposal to determine how we could have some kind of third party um, authentic um, uh, verification process that could not only look at our farm partners, but also our processing partners along the lines of environmental stewardship and also um, um, labor practices. Um, and uh, we are not planning on being organic. Um, um, however, you can still have uh, very strong environmental stewardship, even in conventional farming, um, especially when we're talking about more smaller and mid-sized farms. Um, and, um, and the hope is that she, that we are going to be able to develop this kind of third party verification process. What was interesting is we wanted to do this ahead of time and reached out to the Department of Agriculture, um, as well as uh, I think we reached a cooperative extension and some foundations that work a lot in um, in, farm, in food systems and found that this really doesn't exist. Um, there's been some work with the tomato growers in Florida, but um, obviously we all know of like equal exchange for coffee and fair trade for coffee and, and cocoa. But for, for what we are talking about, nothing like this exists. Um, so we're gonna be putting something like this together. Um, and we've actually been working with um, Department of Agriculture and they're very interested to see what we come up with to see if it might be something that other organizations could use to kind of verify their own supply chains um, to make sure again that that um, that it, you know what we want to take pride in is that we're able to offer the customer a fully transparent supply chain of knowing where their food comes from and making sure that the food is grown in a way and 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 really is supporting the communities and everyone who's involved in the production of that food in a positive way um, and that is that is absolutely our goal and so we're hoping to create this. Um, this verification process to, to really protect that promise um, now and in the future. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I've worked with uh, Wyman for a while because uh, we harvest blueberries um, and we've gone through, I think it's HR2 is the visa that you're, you're talking about. Um, yeah. And they're in uh, the migrant workers basically work up the coast. Um, and they just harvest as it goes. And Alan is already, Alan and Wyman have always, you know, had them as their seasons. They, they're shifting to mechanical harvesting a lot now, but I think it's awesome that you have the opportunity to do something that nobody else wants to do. That the nearest processing plant is in New York shows you how weak the system, how big they've gotten, but how weak they are. And I think that, in your goal of 2050, 45% of the food is grown, main grows 45% of its food or whatever, you are gonna to need to be able to process food and freeze food. And that those broccoli scraps could be puree for a nice broccoli soup for you. That, that would be good. Mm -hmm. You can have frozen soups that you make. But yeah. um, good luck with all that. It's, you know, it's obviously easier said than done, but uh, two million pounds is awesome. That's, are you starting that half a million pounds this year or next year? 
This year, this year. Yeah. So our, we're All hoping right. to build one. Yeah. We're, broccoli is in the ground. It is growing as we speak. Um, the building is built in uh, WR Allen. The equipment is almost in. We're waiting on a few last minute pieces of equipment, but I've been told even if we, if they don't come in um, with some manual intervention, we can still do the processing. It will be a little clunky, but we can get it done. There's nothing that's a deal breaker that hasn't already, that hasn't arrived yet. So that's good news. Um, so we're really, and luckily Rooster County is not having the drought that Southern Maine's having. Plus they do have the farm has irrigation. So it's so far, it's looking really good. Um, so we're hoping to be on the shelves for Thanksgiving is the goal. Wow. Congratulations. Wow. This is such a visionary project. It's kind of mind blowing. And I, I, it just seems like you've thought of everything and the idea that it's already underway. I, I mean, if you laid this all out as something you wanted to do, I would cheer and think it's terrific and think there's no way that's going to happen. And the <laughs> fact it's already happening, I, I, I'm, I'm just kind of blown away. Good for you and your team. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, it's been about five years in the making. Um, so it's, it's been a long journey to get here. And um, but yeah, we're we're super excited. That's incredible. What's your plan for leadership for Harvesting Good? I mean, that's a whole company in its own right, yeah. I assume. Do you already have a separate leadership team or are you doing two jobs and we'll eventually split yeah. that off or how are you doing that? Yeah, so Matt Chin, who I mentioned earlier, so he was the vice president of supply chain um, for Good Shepherd. He has now left that role and has stepped in. He is president of Harvesting Good. Um, oh, so he's overseeing that and Matt in addition after, before he was he was president of vice president of supply chain here before this he was vice president of operations at Goodwill and before that he spent about 25 years at Fairchild Semiconductor in sales and marketing as well as some um, um, uh, finance uh, operation role. So he brings a lot of, a lot of experience. Um, what I most appreciate about Matt is he has the humility to know what he doesn't know. Um, and Matt's done a phenomenal job of creating a whole team um, of consultants who's supporting this project. So we're working with um, John Dubois, who is essentially a manufacturing consultant specifically to help set up new manufacturing processes. Um, so he has been kind of a, um, uh, a, a direct consultant being actually on the ground at WR Allen's on a regular basis overseeing the construction of the building. The other thing we've really benefited from is Wyman's and WR Allen, that they have committed their teams, including the head of operations at Wyman's, they have been involved every step of the way, drafting engineering plans, um, connecting us with all of their vendors um, to even figure out who to get equipment from. Um, and so that's been just hugely um, helpful. Um, and then we've been working with University of Maine and their food science lab. They've helped us do um, testing. Um, they're helping to design um, some of the food safety, the additional food safety plans that they need to put in place to accommodate vegetables in addition to fruit. Um, and so we've just been leaning into a lot of different expertise, which has been great. Um, we do, Harvesting Good does have its own board of directors um, that includes uh, myself, um, Jason Fournier, who's also on the board of Good Shepherd, he's head of the manufacturing practice at Bernstein Shore. Um, and then Frank Pecoraro, who's on the board of Good Shepherd, and he is um, former um, president of Coastal Pacific Foods, which is a multinational food distributor out of California. Um, and then uh, someone who's also from another manufacturing company is on the board, as well as uh, Gray Harris, who's vice president of food sustainability for CEI. Um, I know I'm forgetting, and Kim Hamilton from Focus Maine, who does a lot of business development work. So I feel like we've, we've got a great brain trust right now. We also have a great attorney who's been a key helping us figure out the, oh, Barry Dunn, Sarah, I never get it right. Thank you. <laughs> Barry Dunn, Bernstein Shore. Um, Bernstein Shore. I, I you, would love to no, be you're able, from Bernstein Shore. I am. You're from Bernstein I would love Shore. to be sorry. able to claim him. I'm sorry, no. we can't. <laughs> no, he's not an attorney. He's an accountant. <laughs> Bernstein Shore, Barry Dunn. You, you got all, too many Bs. I can't keep them straight. Thank you for that. Um, that was mis, misspoke on my part. Um, and there's Baker Newman. I and then the there's same Baker Newman. I knew there was another better. one. I can't keep them all straight. Yeah, no, he's, he's an accountant from Barry Dunn. Thank you. It's from their manufacturing practice. So, um, yeah, so we're 
pulling in a lot of expertise where we need it. We do plan on hiring employee number two, probably sometime next year. It will be a sales and marketing job. Um, Cause again, this is to make this work it is going to be all about volume. We've, we've got us, we've got to increase volume. So fortunately Matt has already done a lot of visits and he said, he was in sales, as I said, for a long time for Fairchild Semiconductor. He said, I've never had an easier sales job in my life. He's like, people have been looking for this product forever. Yeah, good. So it's been really exciting. He's been to a lot of K through 12 school districts and universities. Um, the other piece we're super excited about is we are in the process of being getting approved as a USDA vendor. Um, we have to be have, we have to have a full year of production before we can officially apply, but we're going through the, all the steps in the process to get be approved. Once we're an approved USDA vendor, that means that schools would be able to, through their commodity program, um, we could actually bid for the broccoli um, uh, product that would go through K through 12 schools. Right now, I couldn't, all right, I can't believe this. Guess how many broccoli providers there are for the USDA K through 12 school systems across the entire United States? For first one. One. And it's in California. So we think we have a pretty good shot at getting the Eastern market K through 12 if we can get approved as a USDA vendor. And we've already know what they're charging and our costs are completely aligned and we absolutely could meet their price. Um, so that's a huge opportunity that would be super exciting. You know, and that's another piece to this is that we're really excited about is right up and for the most part, the local food movement has largely been only enjoyed by people in higher incomes. It tends to be more expensive. So much of it is available primarily through farmers markets, which are not as accessible. And again, they tend to be higher price. Um, and so it's it's not has not been as access, accessible for for um, not only low income consumers but but middle you know middle income consumers. Um, so we purposely are pricing this product. Um, at a competitive price. We're gonna be priced, we're not gonna be as expensive as Bird's Eye and the brand and those other brand names. We're probably, but we're gonna be a little bit higher than the white label that you'll see. And so our goal is to be right in, right in that sweet spot. So it is gonna be a cost competitive um, product to make it accessible for um, any consumer. Mm. What else? Any um, any additional questions? Um, I don't I don't think you you mentioned that we'll be at um, harvesting good is is likely to be at two million pounds and then the projection for for twenty twenty four is five million pounds um, mm -hmm. and it 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 goes exponentially from there if things go uh, as as planned. Was it was this part of your strategic plan or was this an opportunity? that came into your vision that you decided that you wanted to pursue. I'm, I'm always intrigued by your uh, model of sustainability. And I think, I think government should follow your model, by the way, because you actually get shit, uh, stuff done. But um, <laughs> so how, I noticed when you said it was in years of planning, was, was that a, two strategic plans ago, one strategic plan, or did it, you, somebody just say, let's make the food processor. Yeah, so I will say what was part of the strategic plan is the commitment to grow and expand Mainers feeding Mainers. That was definitely part of our strategic plan. Um, obviously, how we were going to grow it and expand Manners Feeding Manners definitely morphed along the way for sure. We were we were never intending on starting a food processing business, um, but the opportunity really just became evident, especially when we connected with the blueberry processors and just saw an amazing opportunity. Um, and we also recognize again, we actually did talk to some investors to see like if anyone would be interested um, and. And again, just because there's not a huge ROI here, this is not going to attract and you know attract venture capital, you know, just because of the kind of business it is. So we really we saw it as the only organization that would go after this business would be one that sees the mission and the community benefit that really could be created here. That's ultimately where the ROI is gonna come from. It's not gonna be in a financial return to shareholders. It's going to be in a community benefit of really strengthening a local food system. Um, and so only a mission aligned organization is gonna to wanna to invest in that. Um, so it, there, it made sense for us to. And then what really became the enabler um, is through our campaign to end hunger, 
um, you know, whose one of its goals obviously is to improve access to, to healthy food for all. Um, and the success we've had with that campaign. And then the Mackenzie Scott gift, um, we did activate um, a portion of that gift to really do the seed capital for this investment um, and really felt compelled that that was an appropriate use of that funding that was, um, um, you know, an unprecedented infusion of, of capital for a food, for any nonprofit. Um, and, you know, we really saw it as, um, you know, this was, a, this was a gift that was made without without any attachments, no expectations at all. Um, and so we really felt like, wow, for the first time, we kind of have risk capital, right? <laughs> Which normally a nonprofit doesn't have. Um, and also we said, you know, Mackenzie Scott didn't give us $25 million to build the world's best food bank. Um, we really believe that she wanted us to try something innovative and do something that no one's ever done before and really try to, to go after some of these root causes. So we took a portion of that gift and felt um, really empowered to do something innovative with it. And so that that kind of became the real um, um, lever that allowed us to really get this off the ground. You, you've done her proud. <laughs> Maybe she'll give us more. <laughs> That's not the first response that comes. To me. <laughs> we have we have other ideas, <laughs> but it's great. So, are you no. doing a number of sessions like this, trying to get the word out? It sounds like you've done a number already. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing some with with donors again. That we just we just really went public with with um, the information, and obviously, we what we assumed is a lot of folks were like, they're doing what. You know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that sounds cool, but what? Um, yeah. And so we wanted to have an opportunity to just explain and answer oh, questions. And <laughs> thank you, thank you for taking the time to do that. This is really wonderful. I feel so inspired and impressed. Good. Well, we appreciate your interest. And I, I just want to say that I think that what's great about it is that you kind of opened up the eyes to if we are gonna be successful in all that we're trying to do here, we do have to bring it back to some more control within whether it's, my goal is my co county being the best county in the state, but you know, you're working to make Maine the best state in the Northeast and its food production, how that does that. And this is an incredibly large step where all of these organic farmers, regular farmers, they, they can actually think beyond the three month window that they have. Uh, we're gonna have lots of land, lots of water. And so this is a great processing though. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Amazing. Well, what's really amazing too is that Allen's has this freezing plant, right? So that's how they do the blueberries. They basically bring them up and they just stack them in there, right? And they freeze them. And then they, they, they hand clean them, mm -hmm. right? To put them in the, before they put them in the packages. But they're only open, you know, two months of the year. Yeah. And then they have all this equipment sitting there for 10 months that you're going to at least expand how it can be used. That's awesome. Yeah, they they think um, if if we meet the goals we hope to meet, we're going to triple the we're going to triple their revenue for that business. Wow. So that's wow. Real, that's super exciting. Talk about a win win. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. They must hold the door when you show up. <laughs> it's funny because, you know, we have, we, have these, we have all these attorneys drafting contracts because, you know, rightfully so, our board is like, we're investing all this equipment that's going to go in somebody else's building. Like, what if they totally just like walk away and we're like, trust us, they're not walking away. Like we are answering their, we are answering yeah, a huge yeah. need for them, but yeah. we get it. We're still drafting contracts and we're doing, we're doing all that stuff you're supposed to do, but, <laughs> that's awesome. but they're committed. No, I bet they are. <laughs> I'm going to have to jump too. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this tremendously and I really am wildly impressed. Congratulations and good luck continuing on this journey. It's really great. Thank you. And thanks, yeah. for, thanks so much for joining us, Joan. And My pleasure. Really appreciate Bye. It. And, and I will say for uh, the other folks on, um, I, we, if you feel free to jump in with another question or if you would like to um, log off, you can, and we'll stick around for a little bit longer to continue the discussion or answer any additional questions that you have. And just really wanna thank you, um, uh, Suzanne, Robert, Rick, thank you so much for, for being here to, to hear about the exciting project and, um, we, uh, we look forward to sharing uh, more great news as this unfolds. And uh, be looking for broccoli at uh, Harvesting Good Broccoli in Hannaford uh, by Thanksgiving.
How exciting. How exciting for Hannaford to get you to be their partner that they can distribute your product. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good to uh, see you all again. And again, I love the inspiration. And it's almost been three, almost been three years since I first uh, heard Tristan talk. And life is awesome in the world of making lives better for people and connecting with people that are the people that care. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Good. I can't wait to buy some broccoli. Good to see you all. Have a great Thanks, evening. Rick. <laughs> Take care. Give our best to Ann. I will. I'll ditto those comments and sign off. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank Suzanne. you, Suzanne. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. You too. Robert, great to have you here as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I'm sorry I was late. Um, I am going to hold my question till I've seen the beginning of the presentation rather than have you repeat anything. Uh, but I think it's very exciting from what I heard. And uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Thank you. Yeah. Don't yeah. Don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Take Thank care. You. Thank you so much, Robert. Thanks, Robert. Take care. Bye bye.